Well, good evening. I'm Rick Dancer. Welcome to Get Real with Rick Dancer. And tonight our show is sponsored by Elements Health Clubs of Lane County. They have three facilities, one in Springfield. They have one in West 11th um, and one at Oakway right there by the Oakway Mall for your convenience. Um, they have everything you need to get a workout. But what we're talking about tonight, Elements wants to sponsor, uh, it's not just about the gym, it's about community and getting healthy and people uh, understanding that their bodies and themselves and what they're doing. And um, this week, we're going to do something a little unusual, um, mental health, because I think that's an aspect of our lives that we don't take very seriously. And I think because of what happened with COVID and all that, more of us are paying attention to that because we saw what that did to our neighbors and our friends and our children and that kind of thing. So we're going to talk tonight a little bit about that. Um, we've got two special guests. Sarah Keepers from Elements Health Club is going to be joining us in just a minute with a personal story on mental health and how that got her actually. She kind of, both of these stories, what you're going to love about this is it's people who went to those places um, and, and, and sometimes kind of a dark place and then ended up discovering what they really want to do and who they really are. So, Getting into that place of depression or, or the blues, whatever you want to call it, and then finding your way out. Sometimes that journey out is when you really discover. And then both of these stories, that's what you're going to hear. So let me bring on some of our advertisers. Also, Chris Dental Family Dentistry, where everyone is welcome. And vaccination status is not uh, something that they look at in terms of treating you. You can be vaccinated or not vaccinated. That's your business. Their business is taking care of your dental health. And right now is a really good time to get in because in October, November, they get really busy because that's when people get back in. So September is a good time to make your appointment uh, to get in there because um, people aren't thinking about it right now. And then our other sponsors, Albert Taylor, um, Endless Possibilities. We have a, a little short clip with a couple of uh, clients over there um, that just will charm your socks off and uh, you'll be warmed and, and loved. So let, let's get right to the show here and we'll get moving. Rick Dancer here. Rush sets in. Now is the time to get in to see the dentist. Oregon's best dentist and still my dentist is Dr. Michael Bratman at Chris Dental in Eugene. Dr. Bratlin and his staff are second to none. You have a tooth you need crowned? Give them a call and they'll get you in ASAP. Remember, at Chris Dental, everyone is welcome, vaccinated or not. Health clubs, you get more than a workout. You get results-driven fitness and nutrition help no matter where you're starting in your health journey. You get luxury club benefits like a heated pool, hot tub, sauna, steam room, and wellness centers. You get academy-level group training classes like HIT, boxing, TRX, and barbell strength. And your kids get childcare centered around movement with activity and a purpose. You get three convenient locations with one membership. All the amenities of a luxury health club with the membership prices of a neighborhood gem. Elements Health Clubs, we are more than a workout. And they are more than a workout. And joining us is Sarah, who you just saw there. Hi, Sarah Keepers. How are you? Hi, I'm so good, Rick. How are you? Good. So good. we're going to talk about something kind of personal and serious here um, for a moment. And you agreed we talked about this. And so it's not like we're springing this on you. <laughs> but I remember Kathy and I were talking the other day. And I remember when you first started coming to the gym, um, you didn't know anything. I mean, you came to a spin class and you were kind of new at it. And we were helping you get your shoes on and get into the bikes. And now you're like this fitness person and you're, you know, a big wig at Elements Health Clubs and you're, you're, this has really kind of changed. How did you get from first to the gym in the first place? What was going on in your world? Well, you know, when I first started coming to the gym, it was um, initially to lose weight from having a, my fourth child. Um, but I was intimidating, right? It was scary to walk through the doors, first of all, and I hear that all the time, but really scary to walk into a class because people like you and Kathy, people who've been doing this, appeared to know what was going on, appeared to be really fit. Like, I didn't think I belonged. And it was intimidating and it was scary, um, you know, and and it mentally, it, it affected me in so many ways because I wasn't able to just feel confident enough to do it, um, but but I did. I mean, and luckily for my sake, people like you, in fact, Kathy, and you did help me with my shoes. In fact, my first pair of shoes, spin shoes, is from Kathy, which is so cool. Um, so, yeah, and and I walking in through those doors has literally changed my life. And you were going through some tough stuff at the time with relationships and, and all that. And how has that played into kind of your workout world? 
Yeah. So, you know, I went through a really hard time. I mean, I had the baby and then I was going through life stuff and then I went through a divorce and um, it was the hardest time in my life that I can think of, at least, you know, in this period of my my life. Um, and the gym really, really helped save me and helped me feel um, like I was going to be OK. It kind of gave me a purpose. Uh, I had, I had the community of people around me, like, even though I wasn't coming in and talking about what was going on, it gave me some sort of drive. It gave me some sort of, um, intention for the day, even if that's all I did. Um, you know, when I started coming, I was a stay at home mom and it gave me a little bit of an outlet. Um, and then gradually just became more and more. Did you find, I mean, cause people used to ask me like, why do you work out so much? And I mean, I, I meant this and I said it, I said, this is my antidepressant. Absolutely. I think of it as therapy and I still do today. Um, I left, I would leave feeling, you know, those endorphins, that serotonin, that boost you get, like you never leave. I have never left a group fitness class or the gym and thinking, dang, I wish I didn't do that. I feel worse. The, the opposite. In fact, like I would leave here feeling empowered, feeling good, feeling like I accomplished something, even if it was for a fleeting moment, but it gave me that sense of like, I want to go back there. And it started to boost my my energy and my confidence, which in turn helps your mental health. Right. And, and I think for you, then you discovered, OK, you know what? I can actually make a life out of this. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. So it's in your crazy. in those horrible moments, it kind of turned everything kind of flippy floppy. Right. Well, I realized what impact it was having on my life. And it was giving me, like I said, all of those those tools of just putting one foot in front of the other when life felt really hard. And I felt like, how am I going to get through this day? Like it gave me a sense of purpose. And when I realized how much it impacted me, I thought I might be able to help other people, right? Like I was approached and maybe just because of the way I love to connect with people, you know, human interaction is super important to me. And I think that I was able and am able to share without sharing personal details like I am now, but share like my experience with other people and just pulling it in and making it the sense of community, knowing that the benefits out, I mean, the benefits are far beyond the, the look, the body, any of that. So is the, um, is kind of, are people kind of like your drug of choice? I, well, they are, they really are. People and, and bringing joy to people. Like I am, I'm still, you know, I'm now a single mom of multiple children and it's, it's a lot, but I love the fact that I can come here and stay positive and stay in it. And life is really good. Doesn't mean it's perfect and doesn't mean it's easy. Like, let's not be fooled by people's what they put out there. Like, my life is really good, but it's still, you know, there's still struggles. And I am so glad that I have these tools and I have the support of just coming. Um, people, I get as much from people as they get from me taking my classes, I guess, if that's a, a way to say it. You also find that for me, it's like, I feel like why I work out in the morning is because if the whole rest of the day goes to hell in a handbasket, I know I got something done for my body, for me, for my, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like, okay, I got something done today. Cause exactly. something, you know, my, my, my calendar is just like, you know, weighting yeah. me down and it's like, I already ran five miles this morning. Screw yeah, you feel so some hard. kind of accomplishment. And that's really important. And I share that with people I mentor now. Um, you know, like when you're when you're in the thick of those those hard times, it's like I always say pick three things that you could just accomplish that day. And that might be simple things as like get the mail, exercise and eat healthy food. And if that's all you do to get you through to the next day and then you can add on. I mean, exercise played so much into me getting healthy and getting confident to where I could make a career out of this that changed my life that gave me the ability to now use this as not only a tool but like changing my life and helping other people change their lives in the process and making a living out of doing it it's like I it couldn't be better see and don't you think like a hundred years ago people didn't have to do this because you work so damn hard in the fields and farming yeah. like your family you know they have a farm and mm -hmm. you know you're you're constantly working. Kathy and I find on the weekends, we're not going to the gym anymore because we're working in our yard. We're pulling yeah. branches out yeah. and, you know, and I wore, I wore my little calorie, my mice. Well, that's functional fitness, right? Like that's what we talk about in here is like, we come to the gym so that we can show up for our life and mentally and physically. So you can do yard works. So you can do all those things, right? Like if, if it's just a tool to do the rest of your life. Right. Because I think sometimes there's people that think, oh, you're just spending your life in the gym. No, you're doing that so that when I go on a mountain bike ride, some guy asked me today, what are you training for? Because you, you and your wife work out really hard. And I said, um, life. Yes, exactly. <laughs> because when, 
route the, the mountain bike guy told us, well, if you're going on gravel roads, you might, you're probably going to want to go maybe 10 miles. Well, you know, we're doing 25 and 30. Right. You know? yeah. and it's like, cause that's just, that's kind of part of the game and part of beating. It and it becomes addicting and it becomes something that you want more of. But again, it's really, if people didn't feel as good as they felt inside, I don't think there would be the continued drive because looks and those things fade, but feeling so good, just, it just fuels you to be able to show up, you know, how you want to show up. You know, you can kick some ass and you're proud of it. Seriously. Yeah. And it's, again, it's like you said, something that you accomplished, even if all you did was get up. And even if it's not going to the gym, you know, of course I want people to come to the gym because that's where my life has been changed so much because you get that sense of community. But even if it's just as simple as a walk, you know, starting one day that if you can't get out of bed or you feel so stuck, like taking a 10 minute walk, your energy, your, your, your mood will be boosted to some degree. And then maybe the next day you add a little more and it's, it can be baby steps until you, you know, step in and come into a group fitness class and, and just see what happens. Like just be open-minded. Yeah. Sarah Capers, thank you. Uh, thank we appreciate you, so much, you and what you're doing and sharing your story like that. But I know you have um, a whole classroom of people waiting for you in 20 minutes that you're going to go yeah. kick some blood in. Absolutely. And That's my plan. She looks, you guys, she looks so nice and caring and all that. Get her the door shut. She, yeah, it won't work. <laughs> well, you know, we, we're changing lives here. So I, I'll do it however I got to do it. All right, Sarah Keepers, thank you very much. All right, bye-bye. Again, you guys, Sarah's with Elements Health Clubs of Lane County, and that's Springfield. They have one over there off Game Farm. They have one at West 11th and also one down at Oakway. Um Another group that is changing lives is one of our sponsors, Albert Taylor, Endless Possibilities. Uh, they work with people in our community with different abilities and they do just amazing stuff. We got to interview some of their people a few weeks ago and um, you, you got to see this. You're going to talk about um, having a positive impact on my mental health. All I have to do is listen to these two and it works. And joining us is John and Peggy Devereaux. Um, yeah. They are part of the Albert Taylor gang. Yes. <laughs> How long have you guys been with Albert Taylor, Peggy? Oh, I can't remember. I can't remember either. Since the early 80s? Or the, how many, in the how 80s, we, we couldn't do anything without Josh. Well, you could do a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah but and Josh takes us uh, to Wendy's. Thrift shopping. Grocery shopping. You know. I mean, and honestly, uh, they they see the best in people, you know, and um, and people tend to see the best in them. You know, they're honestly some of the most accepting and friendly people that I know. Right. Huh. Funny how that works. When you see the best in people, they're attracted to you. And when you're kind and considerate to people, um, they like to be around you. Oh, what a novel idea, isn't it? <laughs> so now we're going to go to our um, main feature tonight. Um, it's a friend of mine, a gentleman I've known for years named Matt Haverly. Um, he's a musician, plays 30 different instruments from cello to harp uh, to piano. Um, but during the epidemic or the pandemic, um, he couldn't do that to, in front of anyone and no feedback back. And he discovered this other art form that he used to do when he was a little boy with his dad, who was also an artist, well-known artist in Lane County named Lon Haverly. Uh, was a courtroom artist for us at, at the news business. He did portraits out of the mall. Um, this interview is about how those two kind of that, that heredity, that being open, he was depressed, and finding a new way to work on his mental health came out of something that was both heredity and also spiritual for him. And we talked to him. He's in England, so he couldn't do this live because it's really late there right now. Uh, but we talked with him last week, and uh, here's the interview with him. And joining us now from England, overseas, <clears throat> hello, Matthew. Hello. <laughs> hello, Matthew Averley. <laughs> Um, so he's a, uh, you're a native Eugenian, aren't you? Yeah. Born, born and raised there most of my life. So yeah. And then he ends up in Seattle, but we'll talk about that. So Matt has, you know, this is our show. It's elements health club sponsors our show. And, um, you know, but one of the elements of a healthy life, I think is getting healthy and, and finding your gifts and a guy like you. Um, so I know Matt from the face center days church. Um, he played. I mean, how many instruments do you play? 
a lot a long list like at least a dozen most within the celtic genre so it's and, and, and you're not like i mean you play piano mm -hmm. that was my main instrument to start with and then piano and gar guitar are the e uh, the simple the ones everybody else plays but you play uh, you play weird stuff yeah when i was about 30 i started playing cello and then started getting into celtic stuff and like the instruments in celtic and just kind of broaden my array of instruments that I played at that time and, and really kind of went nuts with the Celtic genre. So, yeah, I didn't know at the time that I was actually Irish and Scottish and Norwegian. I, I didn't have this information. I thought I just liked the music, but it turns out I'm actually very Celtic in heritage that I just didn't know until recently. So and that plays the harp, which is pretty unusual. Yeah, yeah. There, there, there's not a lot of harpists out there, particularly ones that play the the fast, upbeat dance repertoire of of traditional Irish music. But, um, but uh, I, I have sort of a reputation for playing the the dancey music in the Celtic genre with harp. So one of the reasons that I'm having Matt on here is because um, his father recently passed, and Lon Haverly. <clears throat> was it, everybody in, in this audience uh, probably have seen his work um, because either he drew your kids or your yeah. face did a portrait of somebody or for us in the news media uh, Lon was the courtroom artist so Lon recorded some of the most heinous crimes um, trials in all of Lane County history and no one would have seen portraits of these people because the cameras were not allowed in the courtroom at that time um, out lawn sitting there, but you had a murder trial coming up. Lawn was there. Mm -hmm. and he furnished those to all the different media, newspaper, television, you know, all of us. And, uh, and then what, what I find fascinating about this is, so your dad's an artist forever. Mm -hmm. And then during COVID you kind of discovered this, um, runs in your blood as well. Kind of tell people what happened. Yeah. So I, for the first time in my entire life, uh, found myself unemployed. Um, and I had just gotten a iPad Apple pencil for Christmas and was starting to mess around with drawing. And I, I, I grabbed my dad's portrait book and, and read his technique. Um, and, and as like, a, thought I'd just give it a shot. You know, I had, I had a little time at the, at the moment and, and, um, that was the time where I just started drawing portraits. I had drawn when I was like a little boy, I knew I had the, the gift. My dad even sold little portraits, or not portraits, but animal drawings I did at his booth at the Fifth Street Market. He was one of the uh, charter members of the Fifth Street Market. Really? And, yeah, and and I used to go there as a four-year-old, five-year-old, hang out with him and, and my, my drawings, uh, he sold there for like three dollars a piece or something, and he said, "Drawn by an eight-year-old," you know, and, and and people would buy them. But I, I, you know, I had ability, but not. I didn't really develop it. I, I didn't work hard at anything back then. So you, know? you truly, at, at that age, you truly were a starving artist. I was <laughs> <laughs> three dollars a painting or a, draw, a, a sketch. You're not gonna. You're not gonna go to go go anywhere very fast but, that way. Uh, but I, it's funny that, you know, he worked right across the street from your old place down there. Um, uh, so, yeah, for a long time. So when mm -hmm. COVID comes, you start doing this with the with the, the sketching on the iPad, yeah. which is still yeah. like some people think, oh, the iPad draws for you. It, it, it doesn't draw for you. It's just a canvas. Right. Yeah. You start with a blank canvas and you've got this Apple pencil. And um, but it, for some reason, the fact that you could just kind of erase or whatever and just try things out, it made me actually work at it really hard. And um, and it it was uh, shortly after uh, I lost my job and shortly after I started drawing, um, my former wife had just a nervous breakdown, left, took off. And here I was, no job, no family, all this uncertainty and all the things that I normally did to like relieve stress or hit a reset. Like I was a whitewater kayaker and, 
and I played music a lot and all those are the, the things that I would do to kind of like, you know, hit my reset button. But all of a sudden I was just like way too overwhelmed to do any of those things. And for a while I couldn't even draw either. And one of my friends, um, an artist friend knew this and was like, Matt, just draw something. You need to like draw something and send me something that you drew and just don't stop drawing, you know? But I was just completely overwhelmed. And after about a week, I, I rearranged my living room into a, what I call an art bunker. I, I took my big screen TV and, 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 and parked an art canvas right next to it. And I just put on like, something in the background on the TV to just kind of have some noise there and, um, <clears throat> and, and set up everything in one room to just draw and live and do my thing. And I eventually just did it and started drawing and drawing and drawing. And, and uh, it, every time I could do a drawing better than anything I had done, it motivated me to do more. And, uh, when I couldn't really do anything else because I was just so overwhelmed, drawing I discovered was the one thing that I could still just do no matter what, you know. And um, uh, <clears throat> so I. What did that bring out, like in your, like your your with your dad for you? Did he like your? You said he didn't really like your drawings yeah. on the computer. He wanted you to go back to the old cool uh, charcoal. Right. When, when he saw my digital drawings, I was like, you know, what do you think, Dad? And he's like, well, he's like, I don't really like it. He's like, you know, and, and, and they were terrible. They were you know, the early drawings. I think you've seen some of my early drawings. They, they were terrible, and he was right. And he was like, I really wish you would do charcoal, you know? And, and vine charcoal is what my dad really mastered. He, all, he does other stuff, too, like color pastels and anything, actually. He does watercolors and all that. But mostly vine charcoal and pastels, color pastels. And he's like, you really, really should try vine charcoal. It's, you know, quick and easy and it can be a really nice. Like, okay, you know, but you have to do it life size. When you, when you do vine charcoal, it's not a very fine point. And so you can't do any fine, small detail. You have to do a much larger drawing. So I had to learn to draw larger, learn to draw with real medium, get used to drawing with these little sticks rather than like a pencil. So you're holding it totally different and everything. But eventually he, I got it. And he was right. It was the best thing I ever decided to do. And once at, at some point, my charcoal started hitting the mark and my dad was like, you've got this, like, huh. you can do this, you know? And it did, I wasn't fast like him yet. It was taking me like a, an hour or two, sometimes more, but, but I started getting it within a couple hours and with a quality that I mean, there was a good likeness and a full range of tone. So Matt, with that detail, <clears throat> um, get, working in on charcoal and getting that detail, what has that changed about the details of your life? Well, you, it is interesting deciding what level of detail to go for. Like, can you really do a photographic realism, uh, sometimes setting that bar is I, I decided very early on, uh, like when I very first started, I, I started drawing the eye. I decided if I can't draw the eye really well, I don't want to do this. I don't want to have like this face with these eyes that look like, you know, dead fish. You know, <laughs> So I like started with the eye and, and got it really good. I was like, okay, I can do that. I'll, I'll go on now. And then, then I decided, okay, I really want to be able to at least do, even if it takes me forever, do a very, very detailed portrait, even if it takes a long time. And I really did commit to that with the charcoal genre and actually being able to do that, seeing the, the likeness emerge and, and a good enough likeness to where people could tell, you know, who it was when you posted it or something, um, that, that it, it was such a good feeling. Like it, it was, it, here, here, here was the pandemic nobody's able to go to their old church anymore. Nobody's able to go to the local pub. They shut down the local pub that all the people in my small town hung out at. It was very, very isolated. I was isolated from my family. Um, 
and all the quarantine things going on. It was right at the peak of the pandemic, but I was drawing these photorealistic portraits and posting them online like I did a couple celebrities. Um, I did you for one. I did uh, the gal from uh, Outlander, uh, and uh, I did uh, Morton Harkett, and I was posting some of these on sites like Facebook sites where people who are fans of these people would see uh, and hopefully recognize the work. And, and it was great, you know, seeing people really see the likeness, recognize the person, and, and connecting with people with art um, when there really wasn't any other way to hardly go out and meet or connect with anybody. You know, and um, and I've done music a long time and posted things, but I never got the amount of likes and response and engagement that I got with doing these drawings. Like, you know, at best, you, know, you get maybe like, you know, 20 likes or something on music. But with art, it was like you're getting like thousands of likes. Why do you, think, why do you think that is? I, I think I, a couple of reasons. For one, art speaks really well in social media. It's one picture and it can have a lot of impact in, with very little exposure. And people don't have time to listen to your whole song or listen to your whole thing, but if they see a picture and maybe it's somebody that they really, really like. So you, if you're careful with what you pick to draw, it can have a lot of engagement. And, um, and it was kind of a good way to be motivating myself to draw with this photorealism, but also seeing people really respond to it enthusiastically, you know. Um, uh, what did that do for you in terms of your... Um, it motivated me. It motivated me to keep doing it. Um, and I was, I was really overwhelmed at the time. I mean, anybody that knows me knows that not only losing my job, but losing my whole family at the same time was way beyond too much for me. And I was just struggling for reasons to have purpose in life at that point. And I, I, I liked seeing where drawing was going and being able to hit these milestones, being able to do these photorealistic things for the first time and, um, it gave me a sense of purpose. A reason. A reason. Yeah. Do you think, and, man, I think it also connected you to why your family, your wife's gone, um, mm -hmm. your, your children, are they still in your life? No. Uh, it's been one of those very uh, extreme parent alienation type situations. Um, so sometimes about, it just looks like that. What about your brother? My brother, I'm still in contact with my brother, but we have kind of a, a strained relationship as it is. So, so um, do, you think, do you think part of this art thing then was a, it also helped you find something with your dad? Yeah, I, you know, it's kind of funny. Most of my life, I was trying not to be like my dad. And then I reached this point in my life and the older I got, the more I kind of saw my dad's circumstances through a different lens. And the more I kind of realized how amazing it is what he did with his talents and with his, his gift and the kind of person that he was. And, and um, all of a sudden, I, I was, you know, asking him for advice and and trying to, in every way, you know, it, I, I thought to myself, I remember posting on my Facebook one time, wouldn't it be interesting if at some point I ended up drawing portraits at the mall like my dad? And this was like before I did my first portrait, you know? But, but now like that has become a very real, um, it, my dad, the first time, I, the last <laughs> time I saw him was the first time he ever actually saw my art in the flesh. And and he was like, Matt, you've got this. Like he, he, he was like, these are really good. And he's like, you've got it. And he's like, you know, he goes, it used to take me two hours to do it too. He goes, you'll get faster, you know, he goes, but you've got it, you know? And, and what, um, what did that mean to you? 
Well, it, it was like, it, it means a lot of things. Um, one, that this won't disappear in my family because my youngest child in particular seems to be the most passionate about art. My, my middle daughter also, my youngest daughter, Malia, my middle daughter, Malia, they both draw, but my youngest one, it seems to be very passionate about it. And I think if she sees me rising to this mark, similar, at least side by side to what some of my dad did, I think she'll know she has this in her too. And she can, you know, say, it, it, I don't know if I would try this if I didn't know my dad did it. But really? the fact that I know my dad did this and can do it and even succeeded at it makes me, makes me feel like, yeah, I really should try this, you know? And I so hope that I can do the same thing for my kids. So you're making a business of this. So you people in the audience, they can, they can, uh, obviously, um, this, <clears throat> I had so much response to this, um, mm -hmm. you do this. Um, and, and what, here's, what's interesting is look at, this is the first one you did uh -huh. and how much more this is really that that's like a carbon copy. This, yeah. one, this one, you can tell it's me, but yes. <laughs> that one is. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes, yes. Yeah, the one is the vine charcoal and the other one is digital. And the digital, you can get quite detailed. Um, but you want to do this for a living. That's what, that's kind of your goal, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think I've always believed that people who can do this should do this. Like, right. I couldn't imagine my dad having done anything else. I mean, even, at, even right up to his last days, he was drawing. And doing during the pandemic, he was doing better than he ever had. Huh. Like he was having $1,100 days drawing portraits. Do you realize how many portraits that is? Like, you know, and, and he, <laughs> during the pandemic, when everybody was getting wiped out at the mall, they called him the money man. Like the, all the other shop owners were coming in like, hey, money man, because they just knew he was so busy and just raking it. I think the pandemic, created a value for a portrait. Like suddenly a portrait, the, I, I think it shook everybody so much that somehow something as uh, existential as a portrait became very meaningful to people in a way that it hadn't in years prior. And I think this fed the intensity of my dad's business success during the last couple of years. Matt, do you think it also has to do with, you know, to me, when I see a photograph and I think we're so bombarded with people's pictures on social media, mm -hmm. it's, it seems almost fake. But when right. I see a portrait, it almost, but I've always felt this way about black and white. Mm -hmm. I think black and white is more clear than color. Mm -hmm. I think color yeah. seems fake, even though that's real life. Yeah. Um, black and white there's that country song about you should have you see it in black and white you should have seen it in color but to me the real um complexity of life is in black and white i think and I, I wonder if people didn't want something they could hold rather than something that's off you know oh we've seen a thousand pictures of matt haverly or rick dancer or something but a portrait of now it kind of it feels more Maybe it kind of takes us back to a time when George Washington, people had portraits done, you didn't have a snapshot. And there's something that's old history about that. I don't know, that's what it is for me. I agree. I think black and white has a real power um, in that medium. It's my favorite too. I mean, I, I'm learning to do color. I want to be able to do color, but I do think black and white has a certain power to it. And um, I think, uh, it also has the ability to kind of, it, it, the reason people do like, um, when you're doing a portrait to honor somebody, you're not trying to do it in an easy way. You, you do it in a way that really honors the person. Uh, uh, so a, a, a portrait done as a commission to honor is different than like a graphic artist just cranking out something for like, you know, it, the way they do it honors the person and, and, so how you do the portrait can really honor and elevate a person. But I think black and white also distills the essence of that person really well. Um, when like the way we see, we see predominantly 
value changes black and white. There's different nerve cells that see black and white than different nerve cells that see color. And the ones that really control most of what we see and what we recognize is in black and white, those nerve cells. Um, so a big part of what we see is black and white. So wonder if we as a culture are so tired of all the gray and the blurred lines that to see black and we just want something that's real, that's black or white. I don't, yeah. want, I don't want all this hazy, um, blurry line stuff. And maybe, you know what I mean? I'm kind of like that, you know, how you take things to a, 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 a spiritual weird thing, but maybe that's what people are looking for is oh. more clarity. And your pictures give more clarity than an actual photo photograph because Photoshop and all the bullshit you can do to a picture now. Um, I, uh, black yeah. and white is what it is. That is a really good point. Um, I think, I think, you know, at, at first I tried to rise to the level of a photograph, but really in honesty, even in black and white, you can transcend a photograph quite well by, um, there, there's a million ways to do that. Um, and I do feel like the, even just a charcoal has a very, strong capability to transcend what a photo can do, uh, especially regarding the essence of a person. Um, so so I, and I think part of that, it, like my amateurish drawings back in the day were, were very pale, not much, uh, not much balance of the tones, but like what you're saying, your comment about the too much gray, it, it, the artist can really change and shift that and really add deep darks and contrast and, and, ma and make it look you can't always do that with a camera the way you can with with the charcoal stick so yeah you're right so has art always kind of saved you <laughs> counting music counting art yes yes although i don't think ever quite so literally as with art itself like music when i became a cellist was right after a friend of mine passed. And, and I discovered I, I'm this person that just is capable of really super grieving loss in certain cases. Like every time somebody passes, it's different, but this person passed in such an unusual event, it really just made me rethink everything. And I, it, I started doing different music, I started doing chill, and that's when I started doing Celtic and all these things. And, and it was good for me then. And it was kind of how I got through sort of a rough patch. There was a lot of things that happened at that time, but nothing like this. Um, I mean, it, and I, it's interesting. Um, there's more to the, the story. I, I should tell the story of really what brought me here to the UK and to Italy and Sardinia. Um, Do that. Just, let me just make one point because in our conversation, I'm hearing something. What's kind of interesting, Matt, is so you had trauma and drama in your life and tragedy, and you went back to your heritage. You didn't know it, but you mm -hmm. found Celtic music and your Scottish and all that. In art, you went back to your heritage, which was your oh God. I never really thought of it that way because I didn't even know that which was Celtic until just a few months ago. Right. But, yeah, no. See, and, and so you naturally, don't you think that's interesting how God naturally leads you to these things? It's taking yeah. you back in time to where you, this is where you came from, Matt, and this will get you out of, and to where you're going. And we always, right. we always kind of put history behind us, but instead in, in, in your story, history kind of is where you naturally went without knowing. That's kind of interesting, don't you think? Yeah, it, it's funny, like the Iron Heritage Foundation, they, they knew of me as a musician and they invited me to join. I said, well, you know, I'm not really Irish. I didn't think I was at the time. It's like, you know, I don't want to like step on people's toes that are actual Irish. Yeah. Like, I don't want to be that guy, but I actually was. You know, but I, didn't right. know. Well, I have Native American blood in me, but I don't want to be Elizabeth Warren, you know, right. and so, you know, it's like, so I'm not going to go around telling, you know, claiming it. <laughs> I have I have records where I got money from the Cherokee Nation, so I I know I am, but I haven't had it checked, so I don't want to be that guy. I'm not going to end up the the, the Pocahontas of the male world, you know. <laughs> so quickly, tell us how I think the story, the continuation of the story, kind of centers around this woman. This woman, yes. So things were things were I, I, I was starting to draw, 
but I, nothing had prepared me for the first Thanksgiving and the first Christmas and the first New Year's away from my whole family. Nothing in life prepared me for how that would feel. And I, I, everything in me said, I will never, never, I'll try everything to get my family back and stuff, but I, I never, never want to have those events alone. And I did everything I could, hoping, hoping, hoping everything would just resolve somehow. And it didn't. And I spent Thanksgiving alone. And then, and then Christmas alone. I, ironically, uh, I was in really, really bad shape. And so was a person down in Eugene, actually. And um, my friend in Eugene was put in the Johnson unit for trying to kill themselves twice. Um, they were hospitalized each time. And the second time they're like, okay, we're putting you in the Johnson unit. And, and they, they were having Christmas and, the, and they, they, they knew that I was kind of going through a real serious dark time too. And, and they're like, you know what? Will you just come down and spend Christmas with us? Um, I, I would just feel better if you were here and I didn't have anywhere else to go for Christmas and my family was gone and everything. So I came down and spent Christmas with them. And, and funny thing, like I, they asked me to baptize them. I've never baptized anybody, but this person wanted to be baptized. So I baptized them in their pool on Christmas. And, and, um, but after, after Christmas was all done and after everybody went back, I went and drew, went home. It was late but I started drawing a portrait of George Bailey um, uh, from the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. And that's the second one I drew actually. Um, there's another one of just his face, that's a portrait. Um, the, the portrait one I drew um, on Christmas and then New Year's Eve, I got the only text that I'd received from my wife saying basically she was not coming back. And so on New Year's Eve, I drew another George Bailey, which is the one that you saw there. I just, all my life, I never wanted to be this guy, but I feel like suddenly I was. Like I, that moment in that movie, I, I, I think that movie really hits the nail on the head for what I was feeling that Christmas, you know? Right. And I wanted to draw something that made people feel like they were there. And I, I drew that picture of him on the bridge, but I drew it in a wider format than it exists. And I did an eight foot print of it. Um, so you could walk up and see it like life size and almost like walk into the frame. And honestly, like that was gonna be like the last thing I drew. Like in my mind, I was like, I just don't have anything left in me to stick around. Like I was in rough, rough shape. And so I made the eight foot print. I wrote this letter, uh, right to my therapist. It was kind of like a goodbye everybody letter. And, and somehow I came across this photo in my feed of Morton Harkett who's the lead singer of AHA, the eighties group take on me. Yeah. Yeah. And I saw this photo and I was like, you know, I've been wanting to draw him. And this is like the perfect photo to draw. So I just said, okay, I'm going to draw one more drawing of Morton Harkett. So I drew this drawing of him. and uh, it was the best drawing at the time that I think I'd ever done. And I posted it on AHA Facebook group and it got, all these likes and really great comments. People just love him as much as I do. But of the hundreds of comments, um, this one English woman, Lisette, um, drew, she drew my attention to this comment. Uh, she referenced a lyric to a song that was deeply personal. It's not a popular song but it was a very personal song. And if anybody knows me or what was going on in, in my life at that time, that song was me to a T. It's called Velvet. Aha, Aha does this song. And 
And it just rung my bell reading the comment. And I, I just stopped. It just stopped me cold. And I, I wrote a response. I said, thanks for your comment. I said, by the way, that song like really gets me, you know? And, and, and then she, she went back and forth. She's like, yeah, I think they're really underrated and their stuff's really amazing. We just started talking back and forth. And, and, and I could tell she was really intelligent and articulate and I could see on her picture, she was really pretty. And, and, um, but we just continued this conversation and I, I sent her a friend request and I said, by the way, I said like, if you ever want to talk about Morton Harkin or anything, anytime, I said, you're like the only person I know who likes them as much as me. I'll talk, you know, aha all day long if you want. And so we did. And, and it just literally never stopped. And, um, and it's, she, she lives 5,000 miles away. Um, at the time. At the time. And, but we were talking, we started talking, uh, messaging, and then we did a phone call one day. It lasted like six hours and we don't normally do video calls. We're not the type to do video calls, but we thought, okay, let's try a video call. And, and I, I called her and, um, the video call, it, first of all, like she, she has an English accent and like, you could just listen to her talk all day and I'll introduce her here in a moment. She's right, right over here. But, um, <clears throat> the conversation with somebody who sounds like that is just wonderful and intelligent and charming. Like you could just talk to somebody like that all day. And, and we did for about five months. And then after that, I was like, I came over to uh, Sardinia, Italy and stayed with her for a few months and we've been together. Um, I could only stay there for three months. So I came back, took care of a bunch of things, selling my house and, all kinds of finalizing stuff. And, but now I'm back, uh, back with her. Now she's selling her house. So we're here in the UK now, uh, where her house is, but her, her residency is in Sardinia, Italy. So we've been in Sardinia. We're in the UK at the moment at her house that she's selling in a few days. And then we're going back to Sardinia. Uh, so let that. me meet her, bring her in. What's that? <laughs> This is the one you've been wanting to meet. Let's Hi. <laughs> Hello. How are you? I'm good. Yeah, you know, yeah. I used to I used to work with two women and uh, at an A and W drive-in. We're from England, and oh. they'd come in, and we would just love listening to them talk because it would be, you know, it was like a foreign language. The phone would ring, and they'd say, "Get the ticker," and we're going, "What the hell, <laughs> ticker?" And they say, put the rubbish out. And we're going, that's the garbage, you know? And it, but it was always one of the sisters got rid of her accent because she didn't want to be that, you know, she just wanted to completely separate. The other one realized that it was kind of a dude magnet and she kept that accent for the rest of her life. <laughs> I, that's what I'm doing. Now, keeping that accent for the rest of my life. Yeah. So, She's a dude. <laughs> so do you find it fascinating what art has done for Matt and changing his world and his life? I do, yes, because um, in a way we're quite similar in that obviously, um, although Matt is an artist now, in the past he, he had a completely different career. Um, and he, although he did some art when he was um, younger, when he was a child, he stopped and, and then has rediscovered it. And actually the same thing has happened for me. So that, that's quite an interesting thing. And uh, Is it hard for you to do? Yes, yes. Although in a different way to Matt. Um, so at school, I was really artistic and really creative and I actually come from an artistic background. My mum is an artist mm -hmm. um, and my dad was an architect so so there's a lot of art in my family um, but when I when I left school I, I, I didn't have a particularly good art teacher at my college so that that really put me off continuing with art and um, originally I was set to do a college course um, and then think about doing art at university but but 
with this particular um, course that I had done and the particular teacher I had had, the focus was more on abstract art, which for me, it, it wasn't really what I wanted to do. And I, and I just found that, that I couldn't engage properly with this. So at the age of 20, I basically gave up art and I did not do another drawing until last year. And oh. the reason the reason being is that when I met Matt and I realised that he was an artist, it it made me think I I should perhaps try and and get back into doing this. And that was twenty six years later. Yeah. So. So do you kind of feel like that there's <clears throat> that we have a destiny if we're but so many things get in the way to try to take that away like this college teacher and people, I remember being, because now that you're talking about this, I remember being in college and having a teacher tell me that I was not a good writer. Uh, and, I, yeah. and so I just kind of put everything into that. And I won the best news writing award in Oregon like 15 years in a row. <laughs> right. And it wasn't because I was like super grammatically correct or everything was right that way. It was because I wrote from my, I learned to write from my heart. and. I think, I wonder just talking to you guys, this is just, you know, how I do my show. It's just kind of pontificating here, but it's like, I wonder if we have these obstacles that come in the way. And if you if, if you sub subject yourself to them, you will never discover who you are. And maybe the blessing in the past two years of COVID, if I say it, then Facebook takes my page away. They, they, they throttle me back. So I'm learning to say, you know what, or instead of lockdowns, I say, you know, other words, but, um, but I wonder if that didn't push all of us into discovering something. If we, if we take the opportunity and not, and, and, and go for it, you find out who you really are. You know what I mean? Yeah. On so many levels. And, and at the same time, uh, it provided unique obstacles for us because during the time that we met, I literally couldn't go to her country or vice versa because of the lockdowns yeah. forbidding it. Right. But it made you try harder. It, it made it you did. determined. See? I bought a ticket when it was not legal to go. Not yet. And it changed a week before the date. Like, so, like, the planets aligned for us to do this. Right. I, I even emailed the Sardinian president. Yeah. Because, she did. because I, I said, look, we have this situation here. I, I have an American partner. I didn't say that we'd never met. <laughs> you said, you just go, he's crazy, and I'm afraid he's going to do something bad if he doesn't get here. Exactly. Exactly. How can we get him here? What does he have to do? And he responded. <laughs> in order to get oh, he did? And, and I, I got a reply back saying that um, he needs to um, have this, the 90, that he could come with the 90 day visa, but that he would um, need, I think, some other documents. Mm -hmm. There were certain things that that were needed, he needed um, a letter to say his reasons for coming and that he actually had proof of visiting someone who had an address, a residency, so not just to stay in a hotel, yeah, yeah, but, but someone who had well, residency. Luckily, that, I did, so was that, that, that helped. Was that yeah. from the president? Was it from the president or just his office? Well, I don't know if it was from him per se, but it was certainly from the office. And But the interesting thing was, is that literally 10 days later, they lifted this this tourist ban. And, and this was the problem we had, that they weren't letting tourists into the country. You had to go so, through an exception saying that I have a provable and stable relationship with somebody there that I'm going to stay with. That was the, that was the unique exception in, that you had to prove in order to get there. So. Well, hell, you had a presidential order. I'd use that. I'd just say, you know, <laughs> you're a president of Sardinia. I, I am to come to Italy. And, and yeah, you know, I, I take yeah, my... The thing is, at that point, because we haven't met, we have no 
pictures together. Right. So we were thinking, okay, how can we prove Photoshop? <laughs> oh, Photoshop. <laughs> that's that is the easiest. That, that, that's not an obstacle. And truth <laughs> lies, there's there's hardly any difference anymore in America. So you can uh, you can say whatever you want and it all flies. So uh, Matt, really quickly, um, because I'm running out of time, but I want to tell people how to get a hold of you. Because I've had so many people see that picture you drew of me and they say, Oh my God, does he do this for other people? And I'm going, Yeah, you know, I mean, even though yeah. I'm friends with the guy who has a presidential order to be in Italy, um, yeah. you know, that you all can have access to this dude. So, how do people get a hold of you? We can find me on Facebook, Matt Haverly, and you can either find my profile or Matt Haverly Artworks is my Facebook art profile page. Um, so Matt Haverly or Matt Haverly Artworks. My email is matthaverlymobile at gmail.com. And I can I can give you all that information as well. But those are probably the best ways to get a hold of me. And, and on my profiles, I have my phone number and everything. That may change, but right now it's 360-353-0116. So those are some ways. Yeah. And to you, my dear, I am very glad he found you because I've known Matt for a long time. And I'm not trying to get over personal or anything like that, but he's not been a happy person in relation in his relationship that he had, as you know, sure, and yeah. treated very well. And I love seeing the pictures of you because I see the real Matt, who he was supposed to be and was all along. And I see that in the pictures of you. So I'm really happy that you came into my friend's life because he deserved you for a long time. And he was oh. just just biting his time and waiting for that to happen so yeah well it was divine timing i think yeah <laughs> see <laughs> like that see, <laughs> covid was not the worst thing that ever happened in the world the reaction to it yes but the, yeah. the actual thing no you guys thank you so much for um being on here and um i if anybody in the audience wants to uh Find out more, you know, Matt Haverly, and yeah, uh, just find him on Facebook or go on my Facebook and just look him up. He's the only Matt Haverly yeah. that I have on my page. And it was nice to meet you. It's sort yeah. of like in person. Well, you guys met this way in person, so what the hell? I can do that too. <laughs> and when you get an extra room, Kathy and I'll come visit you. We'd love to come. Um, by, Actually, I want the that. presidential. I want the presidential order too. Okay. And if you guys want to come, to if you want to have come to Montana, we are, you know, we're almost done with the Airbnb downstairs. So we got a place to be. Yeah. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful state and people are free here. It's really, yeah. unusual. you'll, you'll be really shocked being when coming from Oregon and Washington, Matt, it'll really surprise you. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You should have seen us try to go get a coffee in Seattle oh, during, the, during the, uh, the, uh, vaccine Nazi phase there. It was, it was yeah. awful. Now you're going to get me pulled if you're not careful. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. I'll see you later. Thank you. Bye. All right. Again, uh, Matt Haverly. Um, yeah, cool guy and does some really amazing stuff. It's just fun to watch people's lives um, when you know where, they're, where they've come from and where they're going. Um, and all the little intricate things where God kisses you in the, in the meantime. So um, that's it for this show. Thank you, Elements Health Clubs of, of Lane County for sponsoring not always just good health, but good mental health um, is, is a part of a healthy life. And also Chris Dental Family Dentistry, where everyone is welcome. Vaccinated status doesn't matter to them. Just make sure you get in and get your work done. All right. Thank you. Good night.